So today we're going to talk about rocking Docker with PowerShell. But before we get to that, we have to thank our sponsors: Patch My PC, Chocolatey, Pure Storage, Manning, Data On, Script Runner, and PDQ. Help make the summit possible. Thank you, sponsors. So let's get into it, shall we? Brief introduction, in case you don't know me from Adam. I am actually not Adam, I'm James. James from Start Automating. I was on the PowerShell team between 2006 and 2010, and I started one of the first PowerShell shops in 2010. And I've been doing it ever since. Helped a lot of people with their PowerShell over the years, and I built a lot of tools for the community. I have at least somewhat recently started to refer to myself as a jack of all trades and a master of PowerShell. Because I don't just do PowerShell, I just do basically everything through the lens of PowerShell. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Docker. And then we're going to talk a little bit about cool tools. And then we're going to talk a little bit about scripts as a service. So, first, dabbling with Docker. What is it? What have I learned so far? Show of hands in the room. Have you played with Docker before? Cool. Now, personal disclaimer here. I think I'm only about ankle deep in Docker. So if you were coming here expecting to kind of get up to your neck in Docker, you probably are going to be a little disappointed. We're not going to get that deep technically into Docker's innards. That's not why you're here. Okay? So this first part might bore you a little bit. It might give you something to think about. But here's what I've kind of picked up so far. Docker is a technology we all dabble with, even if we don't know it. It is everywhere. GitHub Workflows and Azure DevOps run in Docker. You're using them, or your company is using them every day, whether or not you think of using Docker. Like, that's what a runner is. That's what it's running in. That's what a hosted agent is hosting. Major sites use Docker for microservices. Like almost every website you visit, at least some part of the page is being served to you from a container, from Docker. So it is everywhere. Most of the major clouds support it. Uh, these slides should be uploaded in a couple days. You should be able to just click through them or you can just search for these terms. Amazon does. What is Docker? You can use containers on the compute engine in Google Cloud. Anybody actually use Google Cloud in here? Noted. <laughs> um, you can also do Docker on Azure. You can do uh, container apps and the Azure Container Registry or service, Kubernetes service, sorry. Um, quick show of hands here, who has used Docker on Amazon? Okay, and who's used Docker on Azure? Cool. It's also the basis of dev containers, which are the ways that you can basically run development inside of a container, inside of, say, VS Code. And I'm looking forward to making that integration really easy, but I'm not there yet. Um, but dev containers are supported in VS Code, as well as a number of other editors. Quick show of hands, who uses VS Code? Cool, so that's, that sounds like the good one to target. Docker is, in my opinion, very useful trade craft. Like, you want to understand enough of what it is to be able to communicate it and get its benefits. You want to be able to work with it because it is not going anywhere. In fact, I wish I had a search engine open to tell me for sure, but I believe it's about 12 years now that Docker's been a thing and in those 12 years, it has gone very, very, very far from huh to all this. So let's learn some trade craft. Talking basics first. This is their own words for it. Docker is an open platform for developing, shipping, containing, or shipping and running applications. Again, their words, not mine. I really want to understand if technical writers at company X, Y, or Z actually talk to marketing at all. Because company after company, technology after technology kind of undersells it. 
I put it as Docker deals with boxes. My words, not theirs. Docker will call these boxes containers. Now, I actually personally kind of slightly hate that term. I have grown to accept it because it has kind of permeated. You know, container's a box. It's probably easier to think about that way. But you're probably more familiar with the concept if you've worked around the industry for a few years as VMs. Although, not quite technically the same thing if you got into the deep nitty gritty, but we don't have to care. They are like enough to VMs. They are nice little isolated VM boxes that you can put anything in. So, let's put on our best, like, you know, Brad Pitt from Seven and ask, what's in the box? That's the first joy of Docker. Only what you put in the box. It's a containerized operating system. It's meant to run as slim as possible. Uh, I am old enough and nerdy enough to remember uh, Gen 2 Linux from college, where that was its whole core of being, is we just want the slimmest machine that's ever possible. Well, not necessarily the easiest thing in the year 2000, but by 2024, we're getting pretty good at it. Docker lets you isolate your code. And this is just fantastic. Because, well, if you really take away some of the PR buzz and view things more accurately, containers are cages. How many times have you been in an organization that just doesn't know for sure if they want to run your PowerShell script? Because they can't trust it. Well, you don't have to trust it. It's running in a cage. You can look in, it cannot get out. Love that about Docker. Really, really do. Like, again, I'm only ankle deep. Uh, I've only in the last like year or two been really looking at how I'll containerize everything and make PowerShell go interesting places with it. And I'm just so enamored with this particular aspect of it because Holy crap, we get to stop fighting that internal adoption battle and just let things run in their isolated cages. And we get to worry a lot less about security because they're running in a constrained cage. We'll get to a really crazy example of that when we get to demo time. But let's talk about constructing containers first. Again, might be boring to you if you already know Docker. I'm sorry, but coming in assuming that somebody knows nothing. If you did know, Docker containers are built with a Docker file. No extension. Because why would you need an extension? But a Docker file is a really, really, really simple language. In fact, it has 18 commands total with no ifs. So I'm actually pleased to announce that in vNext of PipeScript, Docker will be the first language where PipeScript has 100% templating coverage because there's only 18 commands for me to write a PowerShell equivalent to just go generate that. But you really only need a few. Here are the ones that I think you need to know. From, that's a big one, it'll pull in an image. So you can say, from whatever container that exists. And that's gonna become the base of the image. Uh, there was a Docker presentation I went to a number of years ago that really loved its Shrek analogies. And, you know, onions have layers, ogres have layers, containers have layers. So your first layer is going to be what you're coming from. They might have a whole other world inside of there. You don't have to care. Copy. We'll copy files into a container. Cool, right? The good gotcha to be aware of is it'll only copy files beneath where you run it, beneath the Docker file itself. That's Probably a good thing from a security perspective, but can be a little bit annoying. You might need to go up a couple directories if you wanted to join like 15 modules together. Not that anybody in this room might do that, you know. Anyway, A and V sets environment variables. So literally E and V, name, value, and run, run setup steps in a container. That's it. I mean, again, there are technically 18 commands, 
but most of what you're gonna do is just gonna use these four. If you want one other cool one to know about, add, you can also just add a GitHub repository or a private repo with SSH. So maybe one more that you might wanna use. But technically, you could get there with run anyway. So let's talk, you know, after we talk pure container construction about PowerShell Docker file basics. Because that was a little bit more, okay, abstract. I wanna get much more concrete. You really only need one line. Remember, just need to grab a layer from mcr.microsoft.com slash PowerShell. Microsoft builds and maintains Docker images, base images for PowerShell. This is running 741 right now. It is always going to be running the latest preview version of PowerShell. So not only do we not have to engage in the, oh, do I trust it enough to run it inside of my environment? BS battle. We also get to skip the whole fight about, hey, have we adopted PowerShell Core's latest version and features inside of our org? I don't care. The box that I'm running it in is using the latest. I will always use the latest. Loving that. To copy the path to the modules, supposing you are in a module directory, you have two things. One, you want to set PS module path. You don't have to, but it makes things more convenient. The path's a little shorter. And then you want to basically copy the local directory into modules slash name of module. Cool. We got a couple more if you're going you know, to pull out the phone. Um, to install modules, that's where run comes in handy. Because I can literally just run PowerShell and say go install a module or any number of modules. So if I want to build a Docker image that contains these five modules plus this one I made, cool, done. To auto load the modules, ah, this is a nifty one. You still have a profile. PowerShell running in Docker still has a profile. It still has startup scripts. And so yes, you can just go ahead and create a profile and import whatever modules in your profile. And then when you are running code in the Docker instance, you will have that joy. Now, the slide is done and you may photograph it if you want. I, I just love how simple this is. Anybody else? Like, are you already in the habit if you are working with Docker of constructing containers? I am. Does this look like it might make it easier? Or has it helped you understand how simple it can be? Because if you were in my talk from yesterday in the exact same room, what did we learn? Modules are just directories with metadata. Guess what? So is a container. It's a directory with metadata that runs in an isolated operating system. In this case, it's metadata is a Docker file or a Docker Compose, if you know, you're combining other things. We won't even get there today. But yeah, it's basically the same process. It's like, can I convert one form of metadata to the other? Can I treat one thing as the other? And I can most definitely treat a module as a container. In fact, this is not the subject of this talk. This is a really happy accident, but the PowerShell resource get module has actually already been looking at publishing PowerShell modules to Azure container registries. I think in their case, just as a module you can install and import, I have to sync up with the team, but this is already a fairly well-paved road and that's fantastic. So I am very, very, very excited about where all the Docker stuff will take us. But let's talk CLI basics, because you know, we need to know a little bit of Docker before we get into the fun zone. Docker has a rich noun-oriented CLI. You know, uh, raise your hand if after all these years you're still a big fan of verb noun. Okay. Well, you know, I've been kind of hammering at this one a couple years, and that's like half the hands from prior years. Verb noun pairing can be great 
it can be a great way to help like you find your way around PowerShell. It's just not the norm for the rest of the world. And this can really throw other people not in PowerShell so C ecosystem off. And it can also annoy PowerShell people as they deal with other ecosystems. Like, why can't it just be set Docker? Well, because most you know, other ecosystems are noun oriented, not verb oriented. I've come to realize that the real joy of PowerShell is actually in its ability to have and enforce naming and metadata conventions. It doesn't really matter that it is a well-known verb, right? It matters that you could predict it, or at least you could try to predict it. So I don't mind. It has a nice noun-oriented CLI, and I can use that. If you don't know any basics, they're all self-evident. Docker build will build an image. I know, just like, who knew? Docker run will run one. Really, just like the most obtuse naming I've ever run across in tech. It's reminding me of star star and C. Docker container will manage containers for Docker containers. This is one other thing to note. Most other languages do not do the thing PowerShell does where we're like, we hate plurals. Most other languages don't mind if there's a plural. Although that may or may not have something to do with international adoption curves of PowerShell versus other things. Suffice it to say that is something that is still appreciated in the rest of the world. To run a known image interactively, I can just use Docker, run, double dash, interactive, double dash, tty, mcr.microsoft.com slash PowerShell, or whatever name of the image I'd like. Now, I will note here, you'll often see this in a very abbreviated form, and I've kind of grown to hate that habit of other CLI tools. Especially if you have tab completion, it's a lot more helpful to know what the full parameter name is. But if you look at most Docker examples, this will be written as docker run dash it. Or docker run dash i dash t. But that is really double dash interactive, double dash TTY. To build an image, docker build double dash tag my dash docker image dot. One important thing to note here, docker images must be lower cased, the tags. This is a little bit annoying, especially if you have a module whose name kind of uses its case in a playful way, but hey, what can we do? It's a Linux-oriented technology. Of course they're gonna love lowercase more than uppercase. All right, so we're at like, not the break point, but the beginning or the end of block one where we've talked about what Docker is. Does everybody feel like they kind of get it a little bit? Do you understand that there could be advantages to running your code in a cage? Or someone else's code in a cage? In fact, I think there might be more advantages to that one. Nice code you got there, buddy. I think I'm gonna go run it in a container first. Seems like a good idea. So with that all established, you ready to rock? Wanna talk about how to rock Docker? Cool. So it's kind of a bad running joke for me in presentations, but it's like, all right, I'm gonna to have to give a talk. And obviously to align with that talk, I either have to build a new tool or release new updates to a tool. So I don't know what part of me is broken that does this, but it is productive. Uh, in fact, actually the module building talk was part of the inspiration for this one because I wanted to basically have a small, sweet little module that I could talk about in nitty gritty terms if I needed to. The emoji module was also built mainly for educational purposes to just be a tiny thing that I can, you know, drill into on stage if I need to. So that was its superhero origin story. Sounds very underwhelming. Also kind of giving me memories of Peacemaker for a second. If anybody gets the ref, great. Uh, Go ahead and install module rocker if you'd like. 
you wouldn't like, I don't know, I'm sad to know you. No, kidding. Rocker is a new PowerShell module for Rocker, or for Docker. What's it do? Well, it's kind of like you get for Docker. Brief, like slightly promoting aside, who already knows about you get? Okay, let's do some outreach. You get is a wrapper for get that returns everything as objects. So you run your git commands normally, and you get back objects and PowerShell formats and stylizes them and adds extended type information. So you can do stuff like git branch, where object not is current branch, pipe to git branch dash d. And before you freak out, yes, it does already support what if it confirm, so you actually get prompted, hey, do you want to delete that? Cool. Uh, UGIT has proved to be a really useful tool. It was a, kind of built a few years ago on a similar, can we do this? Does this work? Oh, it does. And basically what it work, or how it works is it intercepts the XE and Docker slash Rocker does the same thing for the Docker CLI. So uh, if you have a command in PowerShell, an executable, that is the lowest command in the hierarchy. If you have a function or alias named that command, congratulations, it's gonna run before that command. That function or alias can still run the application, the application's still there, but the function or alias is what's gonna be called in PowerShell. So if I have an application that I wanna intercept, all I need to do basically is write a function and stick an alias on the top, pointing to the original executable name. So all I needed to do here was alias Docker. And Docker ended up being a lot easier for this than you Git because Git is kind of a whack-a-mole, like, oh, okay, this Git has that format, this Git has that format, this Git has that format. Docker is really friendly in this because it actually has a way to format any object as JSON. And so for most commands in Docker, I can basically determine, oh, I can get you back as JSON? Thank you. Cool, objects, I'm done. It also extends the input options for Docker commands. Um, this is quite fun. Uh, there are two ways it's extending it right now. One is allowing input on objects that you pipe in, like Docker container ls, pipe to Docker container pause, which we'll show in a second. So, are we ready to rock and see crazy demos? All right, I guess there's one other input option I hadn't mentioned yet, but I will show you it. Okay, now, learning from yesterday, very important. Duplicate the screen, save my neck. All right, so first let's go ahead and import our module. I've already got it imported, but you know, good practice. Now, I mentioned this yesterday in my rocking or in my mastering making modules talk, how if you have a pass through, you can have a formatted object coming back. So yeah, you got little tagline alternation, got your little boxes that alternate there, a little bit too, your version number, and everything was nice blue. So yay, we got rocker in there. Let's go ahead and look at our containers. Got two of them running now. I made a promise. I'm gonna keep it. First of all, did you guys see the tab completion work? That's two paused containers. And we're back, ready for round two. Crazier than that, I can do something like Docker history on a container. This actually tells me exactly what it did to build itself. And that knife. Of course, that's not all. That couldn't possibly be all. Oh, fine. Demo gods be cruel. Uh, 
you can also get networks and pipe them around the same way. I'm not going to go delete any of these right now because I don't feel like making myself any more cursed. Um, but let's talk about the really fun part. Hold on, I'm gonna double check my presentation and see if I'm jumping ahead here for a second. Yeah, we covered tab completion, cover those. No, we didn't do that one yet. Let's do Docker images. Cool. So I've got my hello world image, I've got my TypeScript test, and I've got my MCR Microsoft PowerShell. Um, one of the things that Rocker does support is rich input. So if you, if we're intercepting an application, I already know, like in my heart of hearts, that application needs string arguments because it's an application. There is literally no other way I can pass you an argument that is not a string. So if you passed me a hash table to Docker run, well, that's interesting. I guess I could change the hash table into arguments, couldn't I? Right? And then you can have natural-ish hash table input. And on top of that, you can have easy PowerShell input. And you don't have to deal with the frustrating Docker syntax and bad muscle memory. Just bad PowerShell memory. So let's go Docker run. And I'm going to go run this interactively, TTY, and I'm passing a hash table here. Let's take a guess. Hash table says 1,004 to 80. I haven't explained how the hash table works yet. Guess. What's it going to do? Who said? Bingo. If the hash table key and value are numbers, it will map a port. If the hash table key is a path and the value is path-like, it will mount a volume. If it's neither of these things, it's going to be set in as an environment variable. Isn't that nifty? Isn't that like a lot of tabs you don't have to write? You know, actually I'll show one more thing here because I do support what if. I don't automatically what if though, I'm sorry. That one's a little bit trickier in this context so far. But okay, let's run it. I will ask you all to pity my laptop here because, you know, running on Wi-Fi at a conference on a, oh, I'm now feeling sad and old for my laptop. Four-year-old laptop? Someday, someday I'll old yellow you. Go over to port 1004, which is where we said we're going to map it to. And there we go. And this is a more advanced version of stuff that is already up. I also want you to note, see me control Ring. This is making an actual request every time. Do you realize how bloody fast this web server is now? So can PowerShell be quick enough to be a web language again? Yeah, especially if I'm running you inside of a container. But of course, that's not all. Because I also can let you run a script block. So let's see if I have this one queued up. Ah, maybe. Maybe I'll just have to type by hand. Let's do hello from Docker. Again, pitting my laptop. This is normally faster. Does look like it's still running the profile on that one, so I'm going to actually do the. Up oh, there it is. That's interesting. I'm going to do the mcr.microsoft.com. Oh. And I'm just now realizing I need to add tab completion for previous images. Right? That would be nice, right? 
Sorry, it's a young module. It has lots of room to grow. There. Uh, let's go ahead and actually throw in some coolness. If I can type. Got to remember that Linux environment variables are case sensitive. If you did not know that already, trust me, this will remind you soon enough. So we gave it easy hash table environment variable input and then got something back. Cool. Um, let me double check on where my talk goes after this for a second. We've done a bit and how it works. I'm, let me show you some of the fun stuff before we do. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to run a little, little web server for a second. OK. Uh, not at that, that rate. Sorry, I got to use the right image there. And also type exit correctly. Those things both help. There we go. So, launching this new image. We're launching this image again, okay? Yay for that. It's gonna launch my job in a second, and then we're gonna see some crazy stuff. All right. Control C. Now this is a PowerShell job that is running your web service. You are in process one. The job right now is just returning basically basic content. It's falling back and saying, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and try to serve up some information from TypeScript, but I can change what it does. Don't need to run all that. Let's just go ahead and start with, hey, there, PowerShell Summit. I can type, maybe. Let's go, greetings. Hello, my PID is PID. Change the action of the job. Okay, so I want you to note this web server is running in the same process that I've got the interactive TTY open to. Now, let's get crazy. Hello, my PID is PID. Prepare. To die. Get process ID pit pipe to stop process. You guys ready? You ready? You think this is gonna go bad for me, don't you? This is gonna go really bad, right? Let's give it a random number. In fact, let's be extra fun. Let's go ahead and put a random number in here to prove the point, one. And then let's go ahead and also, just to show extra crazy, PS node write output. Actually, you know, be extra nuts. Go ahead and write my process back to my output. Crazy enough for you all? Again, I'm still in the interactive TTY. Process ID bit. Still in process one, still not dead. And I don't think any other webby language can do anything even close to this. My web server returned objects to its hosting process without the person getting the response on the other end being aware. So not only can I have the server respond to the user, 
I can have the server respond to the server. Docker is a cage. Containers are beautifully constructed cages. They're perfectly constructed enough that if I tell you to kill yourself as a process, you just won't frickin' die. <laughs> Fun demo? Are you both a little bit less scared of Docker and more scared of Docker at the same time? Bit of like, oh wow, I mean, I knew it was like isolated. I didn't know you were that isolated. What can or can't I do? We're still finding out in the ankle deep. Okay, you guys wanna know how it works? That sounded a little bit fun. I'm realizing we have nine minutes left to get through the rest of it. Uh, well, Docker has fairly easy to parse help. It basically is like list of commands, list of options for any Docker command with the usage bit on top. So I don't really need that complicated of a regex to go parse it. I can show you it if you want. You don't really want to see it, but it's basically like, you know, find a line that says commands, find a line that says options, split up line this way, and then take out these pieces of information, and I've got your Docker help as objects. So one problem done. Now, for reference, you git, again, has basically parsing whack-a-mole. Every different command in git comes back differently. And so there are 30 or 40 different parsers in you git, basically, for output. Rocker so far has three. This is one. And what does that give me? Well, once we parse them all consistently, consistently we can tab complete. That's the big one. Like I can, I can obviously let you tab complete in PowerShell. If I know all the parameters, I just, why did we not realize that this also would work for an application? All I need to do is describe all the parameters of the application, which doesn't actually sound that hard if you can parse the help. Kind of easy dots to connect there, right? This is the cool one though, and I already alluded to it, but Docker commands almost universally support double dash format. And in fact, I think this is true of the whole Go ecosystem. Just like, if you're a Go guru, like chime in now. But in Docker, if you'd say double dash format, J, or double curly brace, JSON dot double curly brace, which I think is on, yeah, sorry. It will get the output as JSON. And I gotta say, that's probably the easiest parser I have written in my life, because it's just like, oh, cool, I collect all the input I convert from JSON. Now I have objects. I do one extra little thing where I took the command line you were passing me, and I use that to decorate the objects. And we automatically attach that parameter and decorate the return objects with like, oh, so your Docker container LS. So not only are you JSON object coming back, but you're this type of JSON object. And then all I need to do is add more properties or methods to Docker container LS, the pseudotype. Who here was, was here yesterday to understand what pseudotypes are? Who would like an explanation? Okay. In PowerShell, you do not need a real type to extend types. PowerShell has an extended type system that allows you to create properties on the fly for any object. And the real crazy thing is the object doesn't need to really exist, or for that matter, have a legal type name at all. It is entirely legal in PowerShell to have an object that decorates itself as schema.org slash person. And you could have a formatter and extended types around schema.org slash person. This just ends up being an easy variation on that theme. You've got the whole Docker ecosystem, which is going to basically be described as a series of nouns, right? Noun, 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 or noun, verb, blah, blah, blah. Commands in their vernacular. But anyway, I just basically have to join them by periods, and then we're set. And if rich arguments were passed, we can convert them. So if I know that 
you're going to run Docker container LS. I know what types I can look at for where there could be additional options. And I can basically say, oh, do you have an input parameter? Cool. Do you have an input parameter by name? Good, use it that way. Do you have an input parameter of a strong type? Cool, use it that way. And we're done. So why? This is the question I often get. Often some like variation of the phrase like, why did you do this? Or what's wrong with you? Um, but why Rocket? Well, Docker is a valuable ecosystem already. Objects are really useful. An object-oriented Docker should be more useful to everybody. Um, I, I'm sorry about the demo gods here, but the Docker log stuff is especially potentially cool because your Docker logs are literally your command line output. So if I have a PowerShell script running in a Docker container converting to JSON its own results, I can rehydrate that object, right? Like I can get it back out of my Docker container as an object again. Or I can export CLI XML and put it on a mounted volume. Again, I'm just loving this. I'm, I cannot wait until I'm hip deep in more because this is just so fun. Docker's great. So this should be especially useful to PowerShell people. But uh, one thing to know about me and the way I engage with the PowerShell community and well, tech community overall over time is that I try to think very strategically and engage very strategically. And it can make Rocker a gateway to PowerShell. If you have a Docker friendly, you know, colleague that doesn't know or like PowerShell that much, great way to introduce them to where the object pipeline could be great. Oh, you wanted to stop just the containers of that name? Sure, Docker container LS, where object, blah, 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 pipe to Docker container stop. So this is one of the things that I found you get to be the most helpful at within an organization. It gives me this kind of way that I can basically take non-PowerShell people and lightly introduce them to the ecosystem at the same point as it doesn't alienate the existing ecosystem. So if you're a PowerShell user, yes, I know why I love the object pipeline. This is great. If you're a Docker user, I don't really know that object pipeline, but holy crap, this actually is pretty cool. So this is why I built this thing, that, and, you know, I had to give a talk on stuff, had to build a cool tool for it, you know, obviously I had to build a nice module. It's what you do, man. Plus it's fun. So questions about why I rocked it. Does this tool look cool enough? All right. Um, for extra bonus points here, we're going to go to github.com slash start automating rocker. And it even has a cool logo. And examples. You know, to be fair to my own general horrifying standard, I haven't yet integrated help out to generate documentation automatically. I'll do that in a couple of days. And I haven't yet turned it into a GitHub action. And once I do both of those things, then we're really cooking with gas because then you should be able to basically say to anybody, oh, you want to really rock Docker, you don't even need to know PowerShell or install PowerShell, just go use this GitHub action. Go pass it this tiny little segment of script. Just, shh, just, just let the object pipeline help you. Go to sleep. Um, so yeah, I'm actually, I don't know, I, I feel close to the same way as I did when I built UGit. It's like, I wasn't really necessarily setting out to, you know, do this per se, but once I ended up on the road and found out how relatively easy it was, like, yeah, holy crap, I'm gonna probably get a lot of mileage out of this one. Probably quite a bit. What do you guys think? You can see yourselves getting a little bit of mileage out of Rocker? Cool. Can you see at least one colleague that's a little PowerShell skeptical that you could share this with? All right. So then it's working. Uh, we are technically at time, but let's go into the fun zone a little bit first before you know they kick us out. And let's talk about scripts as a service. And this is a taste of what's coming. Uh, I 
Discretion is the better part of valor. I just was not going to push myself that hard to get all of this perfect before conference, especially because security might be key. So let's talk security for a second. Is it secret? Is it safe? Well, Docker's security boundary is pretty great. We just kind of proved it, right? You know, didn't shoot myself in the foot successfully. If we run our scripts within Docker, then we're pretty much set. We don't have to trust them. Their access is limited. Even if they can invoke expression, they won't hurt us too much. If the container is in a private repository like AKS, no one external can even see your images. But your images can choose to talk to each other inside of Azure's network. So like, I, I'm again, I'm only ankle deep, when I'm hip deep, I'll, I'll expect to be able to talk about this more. But my thought of what would be a really nicely secure Docker Azure setup at this point is basically two containers in AKS, one fully public, one not. The fully public one has no keys, but does know the URL, the private one. And when it gets payloads that it needs to send back, well, it can either do that PS node job stuff to send it back upstream or directly call RESTful URL. Either one, because that second server is inside of Azure's own network and we're all server side, the first server would return the second server's results with complete opaqueness to, opaqueness to the customer. And the second server could have as many credentials as you'd like you'd have to not only break into the first server, but somehow, like if you're super hacker ninja, really, really good, you know, have a bunch of zero day attack vectors, hack Microsoft itself to start to do man in the middle attacks inside of Azure. Now, if you are that person, A, please don't hurt me. B, I'm sorry, but I can't really do much to protect against you anyway. You already would have won and it would have had nothing to do with me, right? But let's Pepsi challenge it for a second here. Can anybody figure out how they would hack server number two there? The server that they literally can't access from anywhere on the internet that, that's not Azure? Not saying I'm unhackable because that's just a wonderful invitation to get screwed. But I think this is going to be a pretty hard to hack infrastructure. So if they break down one wall, they cannot even reach the other boundary. <sighs> Loving it. So yes, it's very secret. It's very safe. Show of hands, who gets that reference? All right, we feel old, right? Yeah. Marathon man. And it could be a service. So let's talk scripts as a service. A script as a service isn't really that different from normal. You're just taking input from the URL or the body instead. Like if you really actually not even stop to think of it, but go back to the literal origins of the internet, it started as a CLI. So you might want to hide a parameter or two, but you're basically kind of already there. If you have a good command, you have what could be a good web service. If you want to hide parameters, you should go ahead and add the management automation hidden attribute to those parameters. Won't do anything in natural PowerShell will safeguard them and hide them in a service. Any command can become a service. It's just a matter of adding metadata and mappings. And if it's a container, we don't have to care too much. If there are no secrets ex exposed, there's nothing to steal. If you can kill it, it can, we will reboot. And we just saw it might even be hard to kill it. So. If you can break out of it, well, that's Docker's problem. Way above our pay grade, not our problem. And I'm just gonna link to some issues here for a second and just kind of click on one to, you know, be in surprise land. These are all public right now. You can comment on them if you wish. PS module info services. This is one of the parts coming in PipeScript v next, and this is the ability for any module to describe a service. I'm gonna zoom in on that a little bit. Can everybody guess what these are going to be exposing? just from this tiny piece of metadata that would exist inside of a PSD1? Does this logically track, like what it's going to offer up as a web service? Cool. Does this feel close enough to correct? Would you like to be able to just add these five or six lines to any manifest and have a container app around it? Yay, all right, then I'm on the right path. 
Uh, you also have PS module info get containers. And this one is already up and running. So I can say something like, get out of my container there, pipe script. I guess I hadn't imported yet. TypeScript is the language built on top of PowerShell that makes a lot of this fun happen. It was also used to help build Docker or Rocker. The other part was uh, easy out. And again, if you went to my talk yesterday, both of those words should be kind of familiar. And if you didn't, go to my GitHub. I have a lot of fun stuff. Um, but if I go ahead and look at pipescript.containers, I actually not only have my Docker file content right there, it would automatically generate one if there wasn't, and I can say, build me my container, please. It's not gonna have quite as cool output, but there we go. So that was a module, just now it's a container. And that's nifty. And there's also going to be site description, which is gonna take a similar format to service and allow you to basically split up part of it to front end and part of it to back end. Hopefully we'll be there uh, by mid-May uh, or early June. Definitely we'll be there by Christmas. So I'm now gonna stop talking. Now you know some Docker basics, how Rocker docs, do, rocks Docker, and how scripts will become services. Questions, comments, nosebleeds, thoughts. Mainly nosebleeds then? Okay, thanks. <laughs>